Welcome to the Loretta McNary Show. And now, here's your host, Loretta McNary. Hello and welcome everybody to the Loretta McNary Show. And this is our first show for 2011. So glad you're here. Happy New Year to you all. This show, we will cover business strategies for success in 2011. So for those of you who have been saying, I want to do something different, well, I have one of my very own adversaries here in business, Ms. Thomasina Tafor. Okay, so we've been doing this business consulting thing for a few months now, and you have really got me focused and di more disciplined. Who would have thought that I could ever do that? And it took you comments. I want to say thank you publicly for that. Okay. So much. Mm -hmm. Enjoy really it. Helped. So tell us a little about yourself and what your background is, and then we're going to start talking about these business secrets and industry uh, forecasts and how to become more successful in 2011. Great. Well, I'm currently a consultant working for myself, and I primarily help women start their own businesses, or if they're happily employed, then I help them move up their own corporate ladder. And I gained a lot of my experience from working at FedEx for 20 years. When mm -hmm. I was there, I worked in a variety of roles, okay. sales, operations, strategy. So I bring into my new business a lot of the things that I learned in my life, both at FedEx and outside of that, mm -hmm. um, through that. And then also I got my MBA at the University of Miami. That's so, what yeah. I love, University of Miami. Go! Yeah. Big so Hurricane fan. You bring so much, um, not only knowledge and education, but experience for one of the successful giants when it comes to business, business FedEx. Mm -hmm. So you're going to share some of what was so critical and you're moving through the ranks to help other people too. And now I'm glad you brought out the part about um, women in corporate America too. Because we don't want to leave them out. We want everybody to experience more success. Absolutely. So what did you, did you go into FedEx saying, I want to get at this level? Or did you say, I'll take whatever they give me? When I started at FedEx, it was my last year in college. And I primarily had to get a job because my mom and dad cut me off. <laughs> <laughs> they had been supporting me in college for many years, and you have to understand my parents, neither one of them went to college, so their attitude was four years, you should be done. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, I started off as a chemistry major, then I went to a business major, and then I went to an English literature major, and as you can tell, none of those things transfer. Right. So, you know, at 18, 19, I'm kind of a lost soul, I don't know what I want to do, I just know I want a college education. So I finally finished, but the last year, that's when they cut me off, so I had to find a job. So I found a very good paying job at FedEx, and the last year they helped me pay for my tuition. So I was really impressed with the company, and when I finished, I decided I would go and sell FedEx. So I actually was very fortunate, unlike a lot of my friends who had graduated from even better schools, yeah. Stanford and Berkeley, I graduated from Cal State Hayward, <laughs> but I landed a job two months later, whereas they searched for nine months and a year and so forth. Um, so then I started off my career at FedEx in sales. Okay. Uh, not so much because I saw myself as a salesperson, but I was very money-driven, goal-oriented, okay. and I'm an achiever. So that's kind of how I started my career at FedEx. But going from college and then saying I want a career in sales, and you're still very, very young, so was really money the motivation for yes. just taking that first job and it was probably easier to get in sales as it was in one of your many Majors? Yeah, in English literature. Yeah. I had read an article right before I graduated, like Newsweek, one of those major magazines, and they had done um, some bios of some of the top executives of the Fortune 500 companies. Mm -hmm. And so I was very curious what was their bio, both you know their experience, but also their education. Half of them had liberal arts degrees, history, English literature, and many of them had started off in sales. So mm -hmm. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do in life, I knew that I was very ambitious, I knew that I was assertive, and I knew I was a go-getter. Okay. So here I'm already working for a Fortune 200 company, why not have that same driven attitude and work for a great company? So I kind of did fall into sales, okay. but because I am very driven, that's why I was successful. Okay, so I want to just kind of slow it down and just talk to not only women who are thinking about getting into corporate America and or business to kind of give them some caveats on how to make that happen because when I think of sales, I'm thinking aggressiveness. You've got to get in there and make that sale, make that sale. So tell me how we can talk to them and then we'll transition to those who are already in corporate America, have the degrees, and just need somebody to say, there is no glass ceiling. Mm -hmm. Well, in the past when I lived in Miami, I mentored some young students at the campus 
Um, and I always told them, follow your heart, follow your passion, not just the money. Mm -hmm. And now I'm currently involved with the University of Memphis and their formal mentor program called MILE. And I say the same things to the students there. Follow your passion, follow your interests, figure out those things while you're here in college, mm -hmm. and follow that instead of just following the money. Because if you do what you love, the money will come naturally. Okay, how receptive are they? These are money-hungry students who probably, like you, knew they only had one more year before mom and dad were going to keep writing these checks. So they knew they got to get out there and get it. So how do you convince them, and how does that make sense to follow your passion instead of the money? They're not entirely receptive, and so the conversation can be really interesting, mm -hmm. especially the young lady that I'm, I'm mentoring now. I mean, God bless her. I mean, she's straight-A student, very ambitious, very assertive, and I tell her that those are all wonderful things. Work somewhere for a couple of years, but listen to your heart. Don't constantly stuff that feeling. Mm -hmm. You know, your conscious will be telling you what you like. So focus on what it is that you're good at doing and what you enjoy. You know, don't let 20 years go by and now you're in your 40s and you have what I call the golden handcuffs. Yeah. Now you're making six figures, you've got a house, you've got kids, and now you really wish you'd followed your passion, but you've got obligations mm -hmm. and other people that you're responsible for. So it makes it very difficult then to transition. So if you start off young in life following what it is that you love, you'll most likely do it the rest of your life. That's beautiful if other people are, you know, telling them that message in college and at home. But still, what about people who don't yet know what their passion is, what they really, really are good at? They're just going to school, probably like my sons, because they never knew you didn't have to go. <laughs> they were just, you graduated, you go to college, and they haven't really figured out what they're really, really good at or what they really want to do with their lives. So what do you tell them? And I tell them that's fine. Okay. You should not feel as though at 18, you know what you want to do. Okay. There are a few exceptions to that. There are some kids who grow up and they know, I've always wanted to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. God bless you, have fun for the next seven years, <laughs> and go do your passion. Um, but that's pretty rare. I tell them to study what they want to, an undergraduate, mm -hmm. what they enjoy, which is what I ended up doing, English literature, and it's still a good foundation. Um, continue, in fact, you will always continue to explore your likes and, and dislikes and even have a second career once you get into your 40s and 50s and that's fine. Mm -hmm. But be cognizant of what it is you enjoy doing. So many times the students that I mentor, I give them books that help guide them. Right. Um, and besides mentioning some books today, I'll give you a, a list that later that you can air you on your website. You always give us a list of books to read and people to <laughs> yeah. follow, so you're really good about that. But we're going to take a break, and I want us to kind of tell people, how do you know what you're good at? Okay, can we help them with that? We'll be right back in just a moment. Mom. Mom. What? You can't find Ichabod. What? You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who would love to put up with you. At Methodist Healthcare, be treated well. To learn more about Methodist, visit us on the web at methodisthealth.org. Today is a special day. Today we gather as a nation and as an international community to recognize the selfless decision of one of the most influential women of our time. She's been recognized by religious figures and politicians around the world. To us, she's just Rachel. But to the rest of the world, she's the woman who, after having one too many drinks, chose not to drive home buzzed. Here today to honor Rachel is the family whose lives she spared.
before the break, I was asking you about how can we, and we talk about all the books that you're going to tell everybody that they should read and who they should follow and the magazines and all that. She's going to tell you about that and take it to heart because it really does help. But I want to know how you identify what your passion is and what you're really, really good at. Well, a little a minute ago, I talked about, you know, listening to your heart. I'm also a big believer in praying mm -hmm. because I think God will reveal the things that, you know, he has in mind for you and your mission. Mm -hmm. But in terms of, you know, an actual resource, one of the best books that I've come across in the last couple of years is called Strengths, yes, with an S, Strengths okay. Finder 2.0. It's an excellent book. And when you, and each individual person has to buy the book because there's instructions on how you can go on the computer and fill out this questionnaire. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the questionnaire, it takes about 30, 45 minutes. It's been a while since I've done it. It will then give you your top five strengths and in order. So whatever is number one is truly your greatest strength. Then number two, three, four, and five. That's what we talked about in mm -hmm. one of our meetings getting for the interns so yes. that we can find out what their strengths are and make sure they're operating in those strengths as they work on the show. Right. Makes a lot because of sense. a lot of times people will think, okay, I'm very good at this, but not so good at that. So let me focus on what my weaknesses are. That's important, especially if, let's say, your weakness in a subject that you really do need to become better. But why disregard or ignore those strengths? And that's something, for example, the school systems, when it comes to tutoring, they tend to focus only on where you're getting a letter grade C and a letter grade D. The weaknesses. Exactly, which it's important to get those up to C's. Right. But let's look at where you're making an A and a B, and let's help those students find uh, jobs or trades where they can do really well and thrive. You know, so as a society, we don't necessarily do a very good job of building up those people who already do a very good job and making them great. Okay. So what, because one of the things that, pe that was easy for me, people always said, well, you had a great voice, and mm -hmm. you spoke well, and you did this well, and you did this well. And I kept hearing this, but it's still not registering that I should pursue a career in that area where I can use those strengths, because I'm still thinking, uh, I got family, I need to feed them. So I'm not thinking about passion. I'm mm -hmm. thinking about Money. sailing and <laughs> exactly. fan bills and all that good stuff. So even when people were telling me this, it did not register until I got my first layoff. And I said, okay, I got to be creative here. You know, mm -hmm. now that I got this layoff and a little money, why don't I decide and find out what my passion is, what God put me on this earth to do. Mm -hmm. And even still doing that, I knew I was a good writer, so I concentrated on writing and starting a magazine. And to do the talk show, that came much later. Mm -hmm. So I want to tell people, is it then all of a sudden get revealed to you, you know, exactly. overnight. Once you say, well, I want to start seeking purpose and passion, and then like the next day you'll know. So mm -hmm. don't get disheartened because it doesn't happen that fast. Maybe sometimes it does, but generally it doesn't. Well, and that's a very good point that you bring up because I really do believe God has each and every person in the palm of his hands. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think some people could maybe look at my career and say, well, you spent 20 years at FedEx. Do you think that was a waste? Absolutely not. A lot of the skill sets that I acquired there, I'm using here. Another book that I read, it's called um, The Path. And it's written by a Christian woman who helps people understand what their mission is in life. Mm -hmm. And I read that book for the first time maybe 12 years ago. And as I was reading it and creating my own mission statement and understanding my path, I kept coming across things that had nothing to do with FedEx. My interests were women, children, nothing to do with FedEx necessarily. So actually the book intimidated me and I kind of put it aside because I'm like... As we will do. Yeah, I'm on this management development mm -hmm. path at FedEx. I love this company. This is where I, I see myself and I continue to progress in the company. Yeah. Then I was one of those layoff victims uh, a, a year and a half ago, which actually I was fine with. A lot of people ask, well, weren't you upset? It's like, wow. no. Yeah. I, I, Not for one moment. Mm -mm. I mean, did you ever think, oh my goodness, I've been here 20 years, now what am I going to do? All I know is FedEx. I bleed purple blood. Yeah. What's going to happen? I was surprised, you know, because nine months prior, I just won the Five Star Award, so it's like... <laughs> You're laying me off. What are you right. talking about? <laughs> Do you not but, see this? <laughs> exactly. I've always paid me well. I've always been promoted. I'm the kind of person I that gets laid off. To. Exactly. I do yeah. what I'm told. Um, you know, so I had mixed feelings. You know, confusion. I was a little confused. What do you mean you don't need me? And then <laughs> maybe that's a little arrogant, but uh, and then the other part was kind of giddy because I felt like, okay, this is a whole new beginning. So how could I possibly be upset if I believe God's hand was in it? 
you know, so that's how I took it. And then I started my own business. This is something I've always wanted to do. I've always kind of done it on the side with FedEx people and people outside. How could you be upset? Well, let me so. ask you this. I gotta ask you this question. Okay, I'm going back to your parents because I knew they would pay for this college degree. <laughs> yeah. And you got this good job for 20 years. We didn't have to, you know, like help you. You were, mm -hmm. you know, pretty self sufficient. So what are they thinking now? We say, hey, mom, you know, uh, I got laid off. First of all, and then I want to start my own business. That's like totally against the grain. Oh yeah. First of all, I've never been the child that my parents really wanted. I've always done things differently. So okay, let's kind of back that up. <laughs> Just, <laughs> let's say you may not have done things like they wanted you to. I'm sure they wanted you. They wanted me to be successful. They yeah. wanted me to be independent. But it's never been in the manner that they thought I would go. Uh -huh. So, for example, when I joined FedEx 20 years ago, my father's a teamster. My mom's part of the CWA union. Why is our daughter going for a non-union company? Ooh. Okay, so they didn't really welcome it. Mm -hmm. And then they grew to love FedEx like I did because I always praised it. And then when I was laid off, oh, you're just going to get another job, right? No, I'm going to do this. I think I'm going to start my own business. And they're like, are you crazy? Yeah, but I'm going to do it anyway. Because I wanted to bring that out because I want people to understand that you won't have, like, the cheerleading squad mm -hmm. when you decide that you want to follow your own dreams, you want to create your own way, you want to do something untraditional and start your own business. So don't let that stop you. Exactly. You know, take it to heart because people usually are trying to protect you. They don't want you out there just, you know, not making any money and, you know, maybe becoming homeless or, you know, begging for food or something. I think that's the worst thing they think. And people right. advise you based on their own limitations and experiences. Exactly. So I don't want people to not follow their heart and dream because somebody, even critical in your life, says, don't do it. Mm -hmm. And that reminds me of another book that I read. I think it's called The Dream Giver. Mm -hmm. And the writer talks about those very same things, but he does so in an analogy with a character that's trying to...